Local broadcast of Arkansas Week is made possible in part by the award-winning Arkansas Democrat Gazette, Arkansas's largest major newspaper, bringing you local, national, and international news since 1819. By the Arkansas Times, keeping you informed by covering people, events, and politics in Arkansas. By FM 89, KUAR in Little Rock, with in-depth news reporting, analysis, and discussion each weekday. Hello again, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us for a special edition of Arkansas Week. As constant viewers know, we'd like to spend a half hour in uh, odd-numbered years, anyway, with our four United States representatives. And tonight, something new. Skype. The Honorable <laughs> Bruce Westerman joins us uh, from Washington, D.C. And Congressman, thanks very much. Uh, for Steve, being with it's good it. to be with you with the, the marvels of modern technology here where we can actually, uh, I can be in D.C. and you in Little Rock and without using a satellite, we're Skyping a TV show. So uh, what will it be next? Well, I, I'm not sure the technology is that wonderful, but it's better than nothing. And we should explain to the viewer that because of your schedule, you were unable to join us uh, here in the studio the last couple of weeks during the August recess. But be that as it may, August is a memory now. We're into September. And right. uh, a debt ceiling vote was imminent. Now it no longer is. Uh, we have kicked that can down the road in a way that has, I have to say, Congressman, absolutely infuriated conservatives. Your response? Yeah, a total surprise what happened yesterday when the president announced that he had reached a deal with Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer to raise uh, uh, the debt ceiling. Uh, if there is a silver lining around that uh, cloud, it is, it's that it's only through December. So we'll have to come back and revisit that in December. I don't understand the logic behind it, but it, it is what it is. And what I've learned in this job is um, you, you can never really expect what's going to happen tomorrow because it'll change before the day's over and you have to be ready to adapt and move forward from the position that you're in. So uh, right now, that looks like what's going to happen, and it's going to be attached to the uh, debt relief or the, the Harvey uh, hurricane relief package that uh, we passed out of the House as a clean bill with nothing attached to it. Apparently, the Senate's going to put in uh, not only the uh, temporary increase in the debt ceiling, but also a continuing resolution that continues to fund the, the government through December at the same levels it was funded at uh, last year. Uh, and then we'll come back and readdress all of this again uh, in December. Th that's not too much of a silver lining, though, is it, Congressman? I mean, your leadership had wanted to be, uh, <laughs> they wanted, they did not want a December vote. You're, I mean, you're heading into a, an election year here. Yeah, we really wanted to, to get this behind us so we could work on tax reform, which is the, the major issue that we want to work on right now. Um, but it's just, it, whether there's a silver lining or not, there's definitely a cloud because it's the cloud of, uh, of the debt ceiling and uh, appropriations and all of that. I will say that uh, we're working diligently in the House this week. We're going to do something that hasn't been done since the 90s. We're going to pass all the 12, all 12 appropriation bills out of the House, send those over to the Senate. Uh, that's regular order. That's the way the government's supposed to be funded. These appropriation bills went through the committee process. They're being debated on the floor. Amendments are being offered. Uh, the bills are being thoroughly debated and voted uh, out of the House. We're packaging those up and sending them to the Senate. Uh, my hope was that the Senate would have taken up those bills and gone through the process. And if they had disagreements, we could go to conference and come up with a um, uh, a report and a, a joint effort by both houses of Congress to fund the government instead of doing another continuing resolution. Uh, but you know, it is what it is. They're sending the the bill back from the Senate with the uh, the CR and also with the debt limit increase, I'll vote against that. 
along with a lot of other Republicans, but there will probably be enough Democrats and a few Republicans that vote for it. Um, that that's what will get passed, and apparently the president will sign it. Well, the House has, in the last well, year, has sent a lot of stuff to the Senate, and the Senate has uh, advised and, cons and declined to consent or to agree, put it that way. Yeah, we've, we've sent uh, uh, close or approximately 300 bills out of the House to the Senate, and these aren't just uh, do-nothing bills. These are big pieces of legislation. Uh, the Senate's been bogged down. Uh, the, the Senate has their rule on cloture, where it takes 60 votes, which means that uh, without Chuck Schumer's permission, nothing really comes up uh, for a vote in the Senate. Uh, I can't control what the Senate does, but I know we're doing our job in the House and we're sending legislation over. And, and it's, you know, we sent the health care uh, reform legislation over to the Senate. We were hoping to at least get to go to conference and work out the differences and put a bill on the president's desk. Uh, but, you know, the Senate came down to uh, what they called the skinny bill. It was a teeny tiny issue compared to the overall health care um, issue. And it was just to repeal uh, the individual mandate, something that uh, you don't find too many people that like the individual mandate. That's the famous vote where John McCain put his thumb down and, and not only killed that skinny bill, but killed the whole process. So we didn't get to go to conference. Uh, Health care is pretty much at uh, back to point zero, but it's not going away. We will continue to have to work on that and come up with, um, you know, some way to address the health care crisis that's looming in our country. Well, uh, let me pick that up there and then we'll go back to some other budget matters, Congressman. But is it your feeling that now when when a strong majority leader uh, with a Senate majority, with, a, with his party in control, your party in control in the Senate, both chambers, but in the Senate, and he couldn't get the job done, or the party could not get the job done in the Senate, uh, even with a majority, is, what, what does that say? Is, is Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, as we know it, is it pretty much now a part of, of the political and the fiscal and the social, even the cultural landscape of the country? Is it, has it been institutionalized? It's still the law of the land. Um but it's still got major problems with it. Uh, when insurance rates start coming out this fall, I'm, I'm sure it's gonna be a much bigger issue than what it is uh, right now. Uh, insurance rates continue to go up, the cost of healthcare continues to go up. And until we address the, the major problems with uh, the Affordable Care Act, I don't see any change in it. We've got uh, counties in the country right now that have zero insurance providers. We've got states that have only one insurance provider. Um, you know, I think people thought it was political speak when the president said it's imploding on itself, but it really is imploding on itself. And uh, at some point, Congress will have to address it. And how we get that through the Senate, um, again, we can, we can do it in the House. We've proven we can do it in the House. But the, the holdup seems to be the Senate. And uh, the process we use, the budget reconciliation, it gets past the 60 vote threshold. The bill we sent over to the Senate only required a simple majority uh, to fix or to do any kind of legislation without doing budget reconciliation will require 60 votes in the Senate, which means you, you'd have to have all 52 Republicans and eight Democrats on board with any piece of legislation to ever get it even heard in the Senate. What, but once it does reach the Senate, or, or even you noted the, the, uh, that Mr. McConnell or the, the, the majority party couldn't, couldn't get the job done even on the so-called skinny bill, does that not suggest that on reflection, uh, a growing number of Americans or rather like the key parts anyway of the Affordable Care Act. Nobody disputes that, that some work needs to be yeah. done on it. Uh, you know, even its advocates there's, acknowledge. Yeah, there's, there's people that, that like it, but it's also driving up. It's the number one driver in our national debt, which now is around $20 trillion. And uh, these the 12 appropriation bills I mentioned earlier, Steve, uh, that's on the discretionary spending, which is around now only about 25% of the total money that's spent uh, in the federal government. When you hear about there's going to be a, a government shutdown, if uh, there's not a new spending bill in place, 
I don't think most people realize we're only talking about 25% of government spending, of federal government spending that's contained in those 12 appropriation bills that's contained in, in a continuing resolution. Uh, the rest of that is mandatory spending, and it's in five programs. It's in Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, uh, the plethora of social welfare programs, and then interest on the debt. Those five things are driving 75% of our spending. Until we start addressing those, we, we will never see our, uh, our debt go down. We will not see our deficit spending go down. Uh, one of the hopes with tax reform is to get the economy growing at a higher rate, uh, so that you've got more people working, more people paying taxes, and more revenue coming into the federal government. Uh, we've seen a you know stagnated growth around two percent of GDP or GDP growth uh, year over year for about a decade now. Uh, one of the main reasons we need to do tax reform is to get that uh, GDP growth up around three percent, which is a tremendous uh, boost to the economy. But we we can't just do this on uh, growing the economy, we've also got to get spending under control. We've got to attack it from from both ends. So, the healthcare reforms we we're talking about, a lot of these regulatory reforms that we've uh, put in place that uh, you don't hear a lot of people talking about those, but we've we've had uh, 14 congressional review acts that passed the House, that passed the Senate, have been signed into law, uh, that are uh, doing good things as far as helping uh, take the the onerous burdens off of, of businesses so that they can uh, be more productive and get more people back to work. But uh, all of these have got to work in conjunction if we ever want to get out of this $20 trillion debt that we're in. What do you want out of a tax bill? And should it be at a minimum revenue neutral? Yeah, well, again, when you get back to the process of how do we get a tax bill through the Senate, it would have to be through a reconciliation process. If you do it through budget reconciliation, I'm, I'm on the budget committee, so I'm intimately involved in this, then it has to be revenue neutral. And that is according to the Congressional Budget Office, the CBO, the score has to be uh, neutral. So uh, what we wanna do is simplify the system. We wanna make it more fair. We wanna be able to, uh, uh, for people to be able to fill out their, their taxes on a postcard and send them in. We want to lower the rates. We want to be able to bring uh, offshore funds back onshore. Uh, we also want to be able to do away with the death tax. There are some, some good things in it, but at the end of the day, because it would be through the budget reconciliation process, it would have to be uh, revenue neutral, according to the CBO, which doesn't do uh, dynamic scoring. So I think even uh, a tax bill that we could get scored neutral by the CBO that because we would see growth in the economy over time, we would actually uh, uh, generate a lot more revenue than what is uh, uh, what CBO would say, and it would score a lot better than CBO. And if you look at, uh, at CBO's track record, it's pretty dismal on uh, predicting the future, but I don't know who who is that good at predicting the future. Uh, but they're, they're the mechanism that's in place that does the scoring. We have to abide by the rules until we change those rules. And uh, if it were up to me, I would rather see more broad tax reform that included uh, tax cuts and included spending reforms. But to do that, you've got to get uh, 60 votes in the Senate. And I'm not sure uh, in this climate we could ever get that. Well, the administration, the president has floated, a sent you guys a, 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 ladies and gentlemen, a tax bill or floated a, a, an, the outline of a tax bill. And it would appear, at least in terms of marginal rates, to skew heavily toward the very wealthiest uh, American taxpayers. Are you satisfied with that? Is that equity? No, I think it skews more towards uh, business taxes to get business rates down, because if we get uh, business growing, if we get uh, employers investing, then it's going to provide more opportunities for uh, all Americans to have uh, better careers and better paying jobs. Um, it, we're talking about lowering the, the corporate rates that puts our businesses on a level playing field with businesses uh, in the rest of the world. We're at an ec economic disadvantage with other countries because of our tax, because our tax rates are so high which that's one reason we're losing American manufacturing jobs overseas because we're not uh, competitive in the U.S. on our tax structure anymore. 
Yes, sir, but on individual tax rates, marginal tax rates, are, are you satisfied with the administration? Or is, is that close? You approve of that? Well, the the actual numbers haven't been released on the uh, the marginal tax rates. I'm not sure what the the administration has put out, but I know that in the uh, the house plan that we're talking about lowering rates, uh, really more for middle income folks than for higher income. Now that's the house version as opposed to the administration's version. Yeah, and I, again, I haven't seen that from the administration, but I know what we're working on in the house. Okay, is a tax bill feasible given everything else that's on the plate, given the given the partisan dynamic right now at play? Can you even yeah, get well, the to a first, tax bill this this year, or for that matter, in the first months of next year? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's critical that we get it done uh, uh, in this uh, fourth quarter this year, uh, so that those laws can go into effect and we can start seeing increased growth in the economy next year. We've already seen the economy pick up. Uh, even you know, in Arkansas, we're seeing a record num record low unemployment. Um, you know, the disturbing part of that is if you if you dig into the data, uh, we've also got record low labor participation rates. So we're seeing, um, I, I believe it's the data that I saw, if I'm remembering correctly, like in 2008, there were actually more people working in Arkansas than there were in 2016. But because so many people left the job market, the unemployment rates uh, lower. When I travel across my district and I talk to employers, uh, one of the first things they tell me is business is good. We would like to grow our business, but we can't find uh, labor. We can't, uh, we can't get people uh, to come in and work. And these aren't minimum wage jobs. These are $15, $20 an hour jobs or even more in some cases. Well, Congressman, I guess I'm a bit confused. You've got near, re well, you do, we do have, and here in Arkansas, record low, essentially record low unemployment. Uh, it pretty much parallels the national unemployment rate. Inflation is low. What then is the case? Where then is the case for for lowering corporate revenues, tax revenues, and for that matter, individual revenue, upper incomes yeah. anyway? Yeah. Well, when we talk about uh, simplifying the tax code, we had about four hundred sixty-eight billion dollars of uncollected federal taxes last year because the tax code is so complicated. Uh, when we talk about growing the economy, a real concern that I have is if the economy keeps growing, where do we actually get the labor uh, for the jobs that are needed? Now, companies can, if they can't find the labor, they can invest those savings into capital. They can uh, put more technology in their operations so they don't need as much labor. But that same set of data that I was telling you about from Arkansas, we've seen the number of SNAP benefits double at the same time. Uh, that we saw uh, the labor participation rate drop. We know that Arkansas implemented the uh, Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act. We see about 250,000 people who are able-bodied working age adults who are getting their health care for free from a, a federal program. So the, the spending on these federal programs continues to rise. And in some instances, we're incentivizing people not to work instead of using those programs to get people back into the job market. And I believe the data uh, uh, fleshes that out. Back, back to the overall Washington outlook, sir, uh, particularly with the relationships between the executive and, and your party in both chambers. Uh, you, you pass a health bill, and he, he has a, a soiree at the White House, and then a couple of days later, he calls the bill mean. Now he seems to have undercut your speaker on the matter of the debt ceiling, and people are wondering who's running the show up there. Yeah, um, you know, like I said, when you think you've got it figured out up here, you're you're in a bad position because it'll change before the day's over. Um, I know the the speaker continues to work. Uh, very hard trying to, to work with the administration and um, what happened yesterday, I haven't had a chance to visit with the speaker personally about that, uh, but I know uh, the message that we got in the uh, in our conference meeting uh, early yesterday morning was different from what uh, came out uh, later in the day. So, um, 
it's a it's a dynamic place and it changes all the time. But some of the changes are with your own conference, sir. Uh, it's our understanding that, for example, the Freedom Caucus, the, the most conservative members of the chamber, are the, growing rather impatient with Speaker Ryan's leadership. What do you th how do you evaluate it? Can he, is he running the House? Yeah, he's, he's running the House. And, um, you know, it's not just the, the Freedom Caucus. You've got a group called the Tuesday Group. I think we saw this. Uh, during the health care debate where you had people on, on both ends of the issue tugging and there were a lot of us, um, you know, the Republican Study Committee is still the largest uh, caucus in the Republican conference and historically has been the conservative voice uh, for the conference. Um, and we continue to work for solutions. I'm, I'm part of the RSC. I'm on the steering team for that. We had a meeting this morning talking about how uh, maybe we need to take a larger role in uh, in pushing policy and somehow try to bring the Freedom Caucus and the Tuesday Group uh, closer together. Uh, you know, President Reagan would say that if you could get 80% of what you wanted in a policy, you should consider that a win and move forward. Uh, one last thing before we go on to a very personal bill with you, and that's DACA. Uh, the admit here again. Mixed signals from the White House. Uh, he, he's put it back in your court, and then he's given you, what, six months and says, if he doesn't like what you do, he may revisit it. Uh, where does this stand? Where do you stand? You know, my understanding of, the, uh, of what's happened is that the, uh, there's six more months to apply, and then uh, I think the, the program could actually go longer than six months before it's ended. But I think this was a good move because I believe the, the previous administration uh, way overstepped on their constitutional authority and separation of powers. And this really was uh, legislating from the executive branch. Uh, the courts are upholding that. I think uh, uh, the president did the right thing, but putting this back on Congress to solve it. I've always said we need to enforce the laws that we've got. We need to secure the border. And then we need to work out uh, whatever issues that uh, need to be addressed in our immigration policy. Um, one thing that's happened since uh, President Trump's been in office is the number of illegal border crossings have dropped about 60 percent. So, uh, you know, hats off to the administration, to uh, Jeff Sessions, to Homeland Security and all of those the border patrol agents that are working to reduce the number of border, uh, illegal border crossings. We have to secure the border. We have to fix the root cause of the immigration uh, issues that we're facing today, like DACA. But at the end of the day, Congress needs to come up with a solution that I, that's, that's fair and that's just and that uh, addresses you know, thousands of people that are living here in the United States that are affected by this. Got to, our time's growing short, Congressman, but you've got a very important bill uh, out of, important to you anyway, and you contend is very important to the nation's force. You got it out of committee. Yeah, and this is the third time we've got it out of committee. It's called the Resilient Federal Forest Act. Uh, I didn't realize when I got elected to Congress, Steve, that I was the only person in the House of Representatives that had studied forestry. I, I did that in graduate school. Congress needs experts in certain areas. I'm, I passed the registered forester exam in Arkansas and was licensed to practice forestry there. So I've got a pretty good knowledge and understanding of, of the science behind forestry. And uh, I've been able to do a lot of work on uh, something that needs a lot of attention, and that's our federal forest. You know, there are several hundred million acres of federal timberland in our country. And uh, just uh, look at the news right now in between the hurricanes and the uh, the tweets from the White House, and you'll see that there's a lot of federal lands that are burning in the West. It's a major problem that we need to, to address, and I believe the Resilient Federal Forest Act is a great first step in doing that. All right, Congressman, we're simply out of time, and we thank you very much for yours. Oh, always good to visit with you, Steve. You Hopefully we can do it in the studio back in Arkansas the next time we meet. Yeah, that would be even better. All right, Congressman, thanks very much for being with us again. Thank you.
Local broadcast of Arkansas Week is made possible in part by the award-winning Arkansas Democrat Gazette, Arkansas's largest major newspaper, bringing you local, national, and international news since 1819. By the Arkansas Times, keeping you informed by covering people, events, and politics in Arkansas. By FM 89, KUAR in Little Rock, with in-depth news reporting, analysis, and discussion each weekday.